Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer and first of all I just want to say thanks very much to Jill for inviting me to come down and, and speak to the group. Um, not only is it the first time that I've actually talked at this meeting but I haven't actually had the opportunity to, to come down before either. Um, the talk that I'm going to give today is very similar to a talk that I gave at a... Um, a public meeting on FTD that we held in Manchester a few weeks ago and that Jill Walton very kindly came down to us and gave a, a wonderful presentation about the FTD support group. So I like to think of this as sort of part two of a bit of a Manchester London exchange trip. Um, so I'm a, I'm a neuropsychologist. Um, I work at the um, Cerebral Function Unit um, in, um, in Manchester, actually Salford which is a, a specialist, um, specialist centre. We run an interdisciplinary clinical service for assessment, diagnosis, monitoring and care of people with young onset and or atypical dementia syndromes, including FTD and related conditions. My role in that clinic is that I carry out neuropsychological assessments of patients who attend the unit, which contribute to their diagnosis, um, management and, and advice that we can give. Um, and in fact, if I wasn't here today, that's exactly what I'd be doing right now. I'd be working in, in our clinic. But I've got a day off from that. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, behavioural changes in um, frontotemporal dementia and semantic dementia. Now, changes in behaviour, emotion and social behaviour in FTD are really some of the key features of the condition um, and are often... The things that people find the most difficult to, to deal with, to cope with, and to understand from a, um, a point of view of being a, a partner or family member or significant other of a person who's affected by the illness. What I want to do today is talk about how changes in the brain, changes in the frontal lobe and changes in the temporal lobe um, affect cognition and how those changes in cognition translate into changes in, in behaviour um, and really in the, in the hope that understanding can help Im, Im, empower people to, to deal with these difficulties. So just to start with, um, just want to um, get, our, get our terminology straight. So um, as you know, I'm sure, frontotemporal dementia is an umbrella term that describes a group of linked clinical syndromes, including frontotemporal dementia, semantic dementia, and progressive non-fluent aphasia, all of which are characterised by distinct patterns of, of changes in the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. Now, to, to complicate things, these conditions have been called slightly different things over the years as well. So, um, frontotemporal dementia, the sort of umbrella term is sometimes referred to as frontotemporal lobar degeneration and frontotemporal dementia is sometimes referred to as behavioural variant FTD or frontal variant FTD and semantic dementia is referred to as semantic variant primary progressive aphasia um, and sometimes temporal variant FTD. So that all sounds very confusing but it's just to say that um, I'm going to be using the terms FTD to talk about the behavioural syndrome and semantic dementia to talk about the um, more sort of language um, semantic variant of, um, of frontotemporal dementia. So to start with, just a little lesson in anatomy. Um, what does the frontal lobe do? First thing that you might notice is that the frontal lobe actually takes up a huge proportion of, of the brain. Um, and some of the jobs that the frontal lobes do that I'm not going to talk about particularly today are that it's very important, this area here, this maybe better than the pointer, is very important for movement. And it's also critical for speech production as well and, and different aspects of speech which leaves quite a lot of space left. Um, and some of the key functions of the frontal lobe that I'm going to talk about today are in executive function, personality and social conduct. So we're going to talk about those um, and how they affect behaviour. So it's worth mentioning as well what the frontal lobes don't do. So what you might think of as the key instruments of cognition, language, memory, visual processing, spatial processing, 
calculation, all those things take part in other parts of the brain entirely, more to be located at the back of the brain. So if you think of the, um, if you think of those things, like memory, language, visual processing, as the instruments of cognition, then executive functions I like to think of as the conductor of the whole orchestra. Um, executive functions serve to control and optimise other aspects of cognition, um, enabling us to function in the most efficient way that we can. We can break down executive function into different components. Um, one very important aspect of executive function is planning and goal formation. So the ability to think ahead and have a plan in mind and a series of actions to get there. Um, executive functions are also important for organisation of behaviour, so carrying out a series of, of actions in a, in a planned, logical sequence to most efficiently help us reach our goal. They're also important for um, attention. So in attention in everyday life allows us to focus on what's relevant, um, to concentrate on a task, to ignore what's irrelevant, um, and to sort of optimise concentration to do what we need to do. And also very important in, ex in terms of executive function is um, monitoring a performance. So when you're doing something, we're aware of what we're doing, we're monitoring that what we're doing is working, it's correct. If we make any mistakes, then um, we can pick those up and be, be aware of them. And a really key aspect of executive function is flexibility. So really the flexibility to be able to notice when something isn't working and, and think about it and change and reformulate those goals and our plan um, and attention again to any changes in the environment or changes in circumstances. So that's just an overview of, of what this um, very important aspect of, of cognition is. In FTD, executive function isn't working properly because of changes in the frontal lobe. So what impact does that have on behaviour? If there are problems in planning, because of difficulties in, in um, planning and, and forming goals, often people with FTD can become apathetic. So planning is a very important, planning and goal direction is a very important motivator of behaviour. If you, can, if you can look ahead and formulate um, a plan, um, then that directs you in, in your action. You've got something that you're aiming for, you know, whether that is running a marathon or making a cup of tea. Um, without that aspect of behaviour, without being able to look ahead, behaviour can be, become um, apathetic. So people can end up doing, doing very little. They're not, they're not um, generating goals or plans. On the converse, sometimes people can be very active indeed, but engaged in really quite sort of behaviour which you might not really be able to see a particular purpose for, like doing a task over and over again, or pacing a route, going back and forwards to the shops to buy the same thing or not to buy anything. And that kind of behaviour is sometimes called perseveration, you might have heard it referred to. And without the ability to plan and look forward to the future as well, behaviour can be governed really by just the immediate needs in the environment as well. So people can be quite sort of stimulus bound, um, driven only by the things that they can see around them. Problems in, um, in organisation um, can lead to, obviously, behaviour being disorganised or not carried out in a, in a, in a sensible, logical sequence. So as I say, any activity, um, even making a cup of tea or, or preparing a simple meal, actually involves quite a number of different steps. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to carry them out in the, in the right order, um, in a timely fashion, or you can end up in a, in a pickle. Um, and that's one of the things that can happen when your um, frontal lobes aren't working as they should. Because of problems in attention, people with FTD can become very inattentive. Um, they might find it difficult to concentrate on an activity for more than a few seconds at a time um, and be sort of flitting from one thing to another. It's quite common for people to tell us that their loved ones will start umpteen different jobs but not finish any of them off. So they'll get lots of things out um, but not actually use them or, 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 or finish what they plan to do. Um, 
it's also in terms of, c of carrying out sort of housework and jobs often people might sort of start multiple things but not actually finish tasks off or abandon things halfway through um, or just be very easily distracted by anything else in the environment and then just not go back to what, what they were doing. So really problems in attention can have a huge, huge impact on, on behaviour. If your check-in processes aren't working properly and you have difficulty monitoring um, what your behaviour is and the environment, that can lead to um, people being prone to impulsive behaviour, so carrying out actions without really thinking through the consequences, just driven by their immediate needs, um, not really thinking things through, not really taking into account what other people might want to do. Um, so behaviour can be very impulsive and not really, um, if, you know, if mistakes are made or um, accidents happen, they might not be really aware of what's happened or able to pick that up. And that links in very much with um, flexibility so the ability to, um, to actually monitor behaviour and then make, cha make changes to, um, to optimise performance. So without that kind of behavioural flexibility that, that, that ideally we all um, are able to do, behaviour can be quite rigid um, and inflexible. People can be very bound by specific routines and unwilling to change them. So for example, um, wanting to um, watch the same television program at a certain time every day, even if the, the environment, you know, it might be that it's Christmas Day and you've got people around and, you know, you're not, we don't want to watch this particular program at three o'clock, um, or wanting to go on a, on a walk every day at a particular time with their partner, even if circumstances are that the partner's poorly, has maybe hurt, them, hurt their leg and really isn't up to the usual stroll. Um, so that kind of rigidity of behaviour. Other aspects of behaviour in, in FTD, which can be difficult to cope with, are what we, would, what we can call repetitive behaviours. So these include things like wandering, walking, a fixed routine, um, or often people might like to um, hoard items, or, or maybe collect is a, is a better word, um, things that you might, might be quite difficult to understand the purpose of. You might collect up things like sweet wrappers or pick things off the floor, eggshells um, and quite often people engage in, in repetitive actions like singing, a, singing the same song, humming or tapping repetitively. And these are more complex behaviours but I hope that you can see that you, you, can, you can understand where they come from in terms of the breakdown of being able to form goals, um, have flexible behaviour and monitor and, and switch to different activities so, you can be, so people can become stuck in a behavioural routine. Changes in eating are a really common aspect of FTD as well. Um, it's quite often noted that people can develop a preference for sweet food, um, even though they might not have had a sweet tooth before, or become gluttonous, um, eating indiscriminately and you know, finishing all the food that's on their plate, and sometimes making an attempt for other people's food as well. Um, th these are very common things that we find in FTD. And again, and these things relate to um, the sort of environmental stimulus-bound behaviour. So being driven only by what's in front of you. So if there's food, then you might just keep eating until everything's gone um, without actually reflecting on whether, whether you've had enough, whether, whether the food's on, uh, whether it's your food to eat, whether you should be eating it, whether you should really have that extra Jaffa cake. Changes in um, social behaviour and emotion are some of the most, some of the really key aspects of FTD. And things that, that often family members find really difficult to cope with and, and deal with. Um, often, people with FTD can become disinhibited. Um, so they may say inappropriate or rude things um, in public or indeed in private. Um, which can be very upsetting to their, um, their carers, their loved ones, and, ma and may be out of character for them. Um, this, type of this type of embarrassing <coughs> behaviour um, is very difficult for people to deal with. People can become very self-centred. 
Um, and I think it's, it's interesting to note in this regard that psychological studies have shown that people with FTD really have enormous difficulty in, in carrying out any task which involves um, putting yourself in someone else's shoes or putting yourself in someone else's position and being able to understand other people's perspectives. Now, you didn't need psychological studies to tell you that, I'm sure, but it's still very it's interesting that, that these, these studies really do marry up with what we see um, what we see in patients, what we see in the clinic, and, and you know what you see at home as well. <coughs> Similarly, changes in emotion. Um, I think it's often emotional changes that are the first thing that, that people with um, that 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 relatives or, or partners of people with FTD notice, um, and it's that sort of change in emotional reactivity. Um, that somebody who may have been very warm and expressive and loving can become um, lacking in, in sympathy or empathy and not really um, seem to care too much about what people around them are thinking or feeling. Um, it's often described that people can become lacking in emotion and quite sort of cold and flat um, and you know may not show the same the, the same sad the same sort of um, emotional sadness to um, to bad news, you know, a death in the family, or the converse may become it not show the same um, so same love for um, grandchildren that they were previously devoted. I think sort of time and time again, people will tell us that one of the first thing that they realised that something was really wrong was that maybe attending a family funeral, for example, and just realising that their um, their partner didn't didn't seem to be um, reacting how they would expect them to. Um, and again, this does relate to um, some research in, in the field of, of, of psychology and neuropsychology that studies have shown that people with FTD actually have um, enormous difficulty in reading the emotions of other people as well. So it's not just that they don't display emotions well, they actually have prominent difficulties in, in recognising emotions, particularly negative emotions, like um, you can see here, um, anger, fear, and disgust. Um, people with FTD don't really seem to, to pick up on those or understand what they mean and tend to mistake them for other emotions as well. So they might mistake fear for happiness or surprise, for example. And you can see how those sorts of changes can really have a big impact on your interpersonal communication. So, that's what I wanted to say about um, the frontal lobes, the cognitive functions um, associated with the frontal lobes and how they affect behaviour. Now I'm also going to talk about um, the, the temporal lobes as well, more, more specifically in relation to semantic dementia, but I'm going to try and sort of marry that up as well at the end. So what do the temporal lobes do? Um, again, you can see the temporal lobes here with this nice um, sort of cartoon diagram of the brain and again we can see it's taking up a really big proportion <laughs> of, the, of the total um, area of the brain and like with the frontal lobes it does a few important jobs I'm going to get out of the way quickly because we're not going to talk about those too much. Temporal lobes are very important for hearing and processing sound and this little red area rather inexactly marks out that area. They're also very important for memory um, and this area, which is actually hidden underneath the outer layer of the brain, underneath the, <laughs> the cortex, is um, really what you might think of as, the, as, as a printing press for memory, where memories are made and, um, to some extent, um, stored. And that's, that's a matter of, of, of a lot of debate among um, psychologists. <coughs> but what I want to talk about is the role of the temporal lobes in semantics or language. Now, what do we mean by semantics? We mean everything. The meaning of, of um, understanding what words mean, what the names for things are, um, recognising what objects are and what you can do with them, recognising faces. And I always think it's really difficult to actually um, explain the many and varied um, roles that, that, that semantic knowledge has on our experience of living. Um, and, and so how the breakdown of that can affect behaviour. So this diagram is just a sort of way to try to, to sum up the different things that we're talking about when, when I say semantics. So words, knowing what um, 
knowing what words mean when somebody talks to you, um, knowing what the names for things are when you want to tell somebody something or explain a story. But it's not just words, far from it. It's also recognising what things are, so recognising what different animals are, um, recognising what different um, types of foods are, fruits and vegetables, recognising um, what who people are, so not just famous people, but also people that you might know. And that's just a sort of random selection of, of people there. I hope you recognise them all. Um, also, um, something that I think gets forgotten sometimes is it's not just um, concrete things like words, um, objects, pictures, but also more symbolic things. So things like um, the understanding sort of warning signs and, and, and signs for danger that are, so that are sort of inherent and we all know that this means hot water, don't put your, you know, do not wash your hands in um, boiling hot water. Or signs for poison, for example. Um, it also includes things like sound, for example, you know, the significance of what a ringing telephone means, or the sound of the sound of rain or thunder or a police siren. All those types of things. If you don't know what they mean, if you can't, if you no longer know what the um, what they symbolise can be um, can have a huge impact on on life and behaviour. So I'm just going to go through um, through a few of those things and, and just outline how they can affect behaviour. So if people have difficulty in knowing the names for things in in conversation, people have difficulty in in naming. Um, it's quite often the case that people may overuse certain words. So if your semantic knowledge is, is degrading, um, you may start to use, for example, the same word for all different types of animals. So you might say the word dog for all the different animals or call all females by the name that is your wife. Um, people can also have what we call idiosyncratic word usage as well. And that also includes verbs. So people might use the wrong um the wrong verbs to describe actions, like using the word twisting or flipping to describe all, all kinds of actions instead of, of um, a variety of terms like walking, climbing, falling. And that can give conversation quite a, a, an eccentric quality as well. Difficulty in actually understanding the words that other people use can have a huge impact on, on the ability to sort of converse and have normal conversations. So it's often the case that people with um, semantic dementia, because of their lack of understanding of the words that people use, the conversation that they start might be um, driven more by their own particular interests, and um, which can give conversation um, quite an eccentric feel um, and I think that, that um, Jackie will talk about some things um, related to that in, in her presentation as well. Problems in actually recognising objects and what things are can have huge um, impact on, on behaviour, some of which can be quite problematic. So, for example, um, if you don't recognise anymore um, a toothbrush and that that's something for specifically for brushing your teeth, then you might use it inappropriately. You might use it to clean um, a pair of shoes or use it to clean the cooker or something. Um, there can also be safety risks if you don't properly recognise objects and symbols. So, for example, um, ingesting um, medication in large quantities because they're, they're pretty colours and, you might, and people think that they might be sweets. Um, or, or drinking um, corrosive fluids because they're stored in a similar location to where you might get your um, juice or squash, for example. Problems in recognising people can lead to some um, difficulties in recognising or failing to acknowledge friends or family members, which can be very upsetting. Um, but y also the converse can happen quite a lot where Faced in a world where you don't know which people you know, people can sometimes, I like to think of it as sort of erring on the side of everybody's a good, good mate, so instead um, people greet everybody as if they're a long lost friend and might tend to think that people on the television are, are people that they know as well. So, you know, in the face of losing that discrimination between which people are friends and family and which people are not, 
um, they sort of instead sort of treat everybody as if they're um, a, a chum. Problems in understanding um, sensory information. So you remember I said things like um, the significance of, of, of a telephone, of a fire alarm, um, of, of a police siren um, can lead to um, lack of awareness of danger in certain situations. But also, if you don't understand the meaning of these things, people can, be, can, can have quite exaggerated responses. So reacting with extreme panic um, to something like a sound of thunder, if you've not heard it for a long time, or the noise of traffic in the road, um, or just something which, is that something which is something that they haven't heard for a long time. And really having a lot of difficulty in tuning out the kind of background noise that we all become used to. We know what it is, it's filtered out automatically, and you're completely unaware of it. I think if you think about semantic dementia and the way that it, it gradually affects and erodes your conceptual knowledge of the world, um, it's really not surprising that people with semantic dementia can tend to have quite a narrowed range of interests. Um, in the face of things losing meaning, it's understandable <laughs> that you would tend to stick with what you do know um, and maybe pursue that to, um, to the exclusion of other activities. In our experience, it's really very common that people with semantic dementia can be very active and able to do a lot of things very well within a certain... Um, within a certain frame of reference within the area they're interested in um, and can often become quite preoccupied with those activities. Um, so you, we find it's quite common that people like to carry out in, in, you know, enormous thousand-piece jigsaw puzzles and they do it amazingly um, or carry out um, things like crossword puzzles or even um, Sudoku puzzles. Um, and you know, I've seen people carrying out really complicated Sudoku puzzles when they're not able to sort of name um, very simple objects any longer. Um, it's quite common for people with semantic dementia to become um, routine bound and to like to do things at a certain time of day. Um, and we would call that clock watching behaviour. And it's a really, really interesting thing that um, people with semantic dementia um, it's maybe linked to the fact that, that they retain knowledge of, of numbers and number sequences and time um, a lot longer than other aspects of, of semantic knowledge. Um, so if for, for some reason, this seems to, this seems to really persist. Um, and I think that maybe the, the ability, you know, again, in a world which is losing, losing its general meaning, being able to link activities and events to, to time maybe gives people a sense of control and, and order in a world which is otherwise um, a bit bewildering. So I've talked about changes in the frontal lobe and how they affect cognition and behaviour in relation to FTD. And I've talked about how changes in the temporal lobe affect changes in cognition and behaviour in relation to semantic dementia. But of course, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, there is overlap. Um, there's, um, in many people with um, frontotemporal dementia, also, the, you know, the, the, as the name would imply, um, they have some um, symptoms that, that they share with people with semantic dementia as well. Um, so there's definitely, there's definitely a lo an overlap as well um, in individuals and with progression of the illness. Also, there's a lot of variation within um, individual people with FTD as well and, and semantic dementia, as I'm sure you're aware. So just as an example of that, some people oh. with um, FTD have a very apathetic presentation. So the first thing that is noticed is that they stop carrying out activities, they become more apathetic. And in other people, the first thing is that they become disinhibited and, and overactive. And that doesn't just seem to be a matter of, of severity of illness. In fact, people can start with very different presentations as well. Um, and, and research is still ongoing to, to really sort of properly link specific symptoms to areas of, of brain dysfunction. Um, and that research is, on, is, is ongoing into trying to understand more about behaviour and how it relates to the brain. So... Um, 
why is this why is this interesting and what you know what can we learn from it to help us um, progress with science and, and to improve the way that we can recognize and diagnose these conditions well, one of the recent genetic advances in FTD was the discovery of a, a new genetic mutation which you may have heard of um, which is um, the catchily named C9ORF72 um, and research has shown that people with that particular mutation have a, have, um, a particular type of behavioural disorder, um, often with symptoms that are, in a way, more akin to what you see in people with schizophrenia, so delusions and sometimes hallucinations, which raises the interesting question of whether different, um, different types of behaviour can indicate different forms, different genetic forms of FTD, or whether there could be a, a behavioural signature to the underlying um, pathology. And this research is one of the reasons why probably often, if you're going to the, if you're going to the clinic, if it's a place where they do a lot of research, you'll be given questionnaires to fill in. Um, and that's because we're all trying to understand more about the natural history of, of behavioural changes in these conditions, which are still under-recognised, as you know. Um, with the hope that in the future we'll be able to measure their um, their response to treatment or other interventions, and you know, with your help, develop better clinical tools for um, for both for caring for people and for research. So, just to summarise, I think I'm just about out of time. Um, behavioural changes, changes in emotion and social behaviour, can be the most challenging aspects of FTD and semantic dementia, um, and I hope that understanding the relationship between brain and cognition can help to explain and understand the symptoms um, and for people to be aware that changes in, in emotion and behaviour are a product of the illness. They're part and parcel of the, of the illness that's affecting people. Um, they're really not, not under people's control. And in the face of that, I think that's why um, meetings like this are so fantastic, really, that, that support for families, um, caregivers, loved ones of people with FTD is absolutely essential. Um, so having a meeting like this where um, people can get together, um, meet each other and share experiences is brilliant and I'm really delighted to be here. So thank you very much for listening. Um, this is that's just a little picture of um, Salford by Twilight there. And... Um, the, the, the numbers of the, the members of my department that I could get to stand still long enough to take a picture of. Um, so thanks very much for listening. Thank you.